So hello everyone, welcome to the demo talk, uh, the, uh, demo section. So we have two demos and then uh, we have one and maybe more lightning talks depending what happens in one hour. And the first demo is by Yuhi, Shishu and Yingying about a noto parallelizer for distributed computing in Haskell. Can go. Hi. Good afternoon Haskell community. Um, this we're here presenting our auto, par auto parallelizer for distributed computing in Haskell. I am Yushi Long or Jaden. Uh, I'm Shiyu Tony Wu. Hi. Right, uh, yeah, and um, I'm uh, Injie Dennis Xu. Um, yes, and a little background on our project. It, we are, first of all, we are undergraduates at Duke University, and this is a project that came as part of a course pro course project. Um, it's from a distributed systems course, to be exact. And we actually we have we had no prior functional programming experience before this. We just had this crazy idea, and then we learned self learned Haskell and coded up this prototype in a month. And so, why I'm saying that because it. We, are, we want to hear your criticism and feedback on this project, on where this could go, on what are the limitations you think this have. Um, and so please take everything that we say with skepticism, with criticism, and um, we'd love to hear your feedback at the um, Q&A section. We'd love to hear what you think. So the motivating question that we have is, can we take a single threaded program and gain some parallel speed up for free? Well, th the main issue that arises is side effects. So what if the same, for example, what if two processes use a same temporary file? Then if you parallelize them, it, they, they, they will run into each other, right? That's, that's the main problem with why you cannot dist randomly distribute um, processes, functions to be run at the same, to be concurrently run. And in distributed computing frameworks like MapReduce and Apache Spark, which are industry frameworks for industry scale distributed programming, um, they usually require two semantics for the functions that are executed. The function's side effects need to be atomic and idempotent. What is atomic? Atomic means that the side effects, you, you know, if you have two programs, running at the same time, the one side effect, you, you cannot get like, you know, you have program one read, sorry, program one write, program one read, and then, well, oh, sorry, let's say you have two programs that increment a counter. Atomic, if the programs are atomic, that means you cannot, there's, the, the programs read and writes cannot be interleaved. Um, so basically, each program's transaction um, this cannot be further broken down. That's what atomic means. Also, the side effects need to be idempotent, means that if the program is executed more than once, it's going, the side effects will remain the same. Um, and as I described it, these two semantics need to be keep kept track by the programmer. Um, and I want to introduce the, what, so, so what options do we have to parallelize the programs in Haskell? Well, we have the par monad, which is a monad that distributes function calls. And we have Cloud Haskell, which is a, a backbone for servers and things to communicate with each other. And um, the thing is, they require user annotation for, for each um, line that you want to parallelize or each function you want to parallelize. What we're trying to see is, sorry, what we're trying to see is, is it possible that we parallelize programs with little user annotation, and by little, I mean close to none. Um, the core idea is to use the notion of pure functions in Haskell. Um, as a refresher, pure functions are functions that have no side effects, so there will be no external input or output. And pure functions can be executed or computed in parallel as soon as input variables are ready. This thing is impossible to identify in object-oriented languages, you know, it, because it, it's not required, it's not enforced from the 
lowest level. So you can get you can call on a library you think that it's pure, but it actually just somehow it writes into some temporary file or something, um, very down into the branch, very down into the execution depth. But it's easy to identify in Haskell because we enforce the purity. Just look at the type signature, a pure function, and a and you know. A pure function has a very pure functional signature, and the function on the right is possibly impure, although takes why well, I say possibly, because maybe monad is also a kind of monad that's that happens to be pure. The idea is that we can parallelize pure functions whenever possible. Sounds a simple idea, but we couldn't find any implementation online or anywhere, uh, so we built one. Yeah, so I'll I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the uh, underlying architecture and how and how this is actually uh, implemented. So the high level idea is that we take a generic Haskell program uh, and uh, we parse the main function and then uh, from that we try to build the uh, abstract syntax tree from that and then, and then so imagine it will look something like that, uh, tree on the right. And from that we can tell a lot actually. Uh, so for example for this line, uh, what we want here is we want to know what are the data dependencies. And uh, so and then so for this, in this case, we have that this add function depends on two inputs, A and B, and, uh, and indeed they, uh, the, the function returns a value that is uh, in turn assigned to C. So, so we kind of C actually depends on the result of the function. So this is, yeah, so this is kind of what we need. Uh, where we, from this tree, we built this data dependency graph. And based on this data, data dependency graph, uh, we have a greedy scheduler that looks at which nodes have all their dependencies ready, or either they, or they could have just no dependencies at all. And then we run them in parallel. And then when, and then when, when, the result, when they return, we take the results, right? And then we mark those nodes as ready, right? And then, so, so for example, in this case, if A and B uh, are finished computing, uh, then we can, uh, basically schedule C because we know that all of its inputs are ready. So, so there are many limitations actually with how we implement this prototype and we made a lot of uh, uh, assumptions. So the first one is that we consider each line as a separate job. So this is kind of one of the main issues with this approach is how do we determine the granularity of these jobs and we have some ideas that we'll talk about later but so with the current implementation uh, so for example for it will be like a line like this for example let x equal to f of a b where a b are the inputs to f and then uh, x takes the result of uh, is being assigned to the result of f um, and uh, in our case uh, we're only working currently with uh, as, as Jane has said pure functions uh, and and we consider it ready, uh, which basically uh, we, we want to schedule it as soon as it has all of its inputs computed. And uh, our scheduler sends all these functions uh, with their inputs to these worker nodes, and then we expect them to finish computing, and then uh, when, when they're done, they send results back to us, back to the master node, and then we uh, basically, yeah, go from there. So we, our approach, kind of differs from a lot of the existing work uh, in the sense that we, are imp we implemented it with a, with a multi-node system in mind, so we're kind of a distributed system approach. So our abstraction is uh, basically at the network, like computer node level. So our workers are spawned by uh, the distributed uh, simple local net package that we used. Uh, and here are some of the main limitations of our current prototype. So we have uh, no support for uh, monadic operations. Uh, we don't, we have very limited support for higher order functions. And one of the main uh, drawbacks that we have right now is there's no inherent fault tolerance mechanisms built in. So we expect that this is definitely uh, something that needs to be done uh, for this to be more scalable. Um, and uh, yeah, so by fault tolerance, we mean that uh, there's a lot of inherent reliabilities both in the network and in how the worker nodes execute these functions. Sometimes some workers are just slow and things like that. So we'll talk We'll elaborate more on this in a bit. Uh, and lastly, right now the limitation is that the user kind of have to define uh, kind of an interface for serialization and deserialization kind of manually for the functions that they want to use. And uh, this is, you know, you can think of this as something very similar to the, you know, pro, the pro buff uh, for RPCs. Um, right. Um, all right, um, so next I'll talk about the experiments we did on this uh, prototype. 
Uh, so basically, the type of task we consider is uh, we are essentially we're just generating some um, very large random matrices, and then we would just like uh, you know like multiply them together, and then at the end we'll just like um, add up um, you know all the entries in these results. Um, and in particular, um, we we kind of considered uh, two, two different types of granularity levels. So um, on the left, we have the fine grained level, which is basically uh, I think it's a really it's like a step by step walkthrough of what this task is. But then we also have the um, the coarse grained type of uh, you know the the workload for the essentially the same task. But in that one, we uh, kind of uh, you know put some of the operations in the bundle, and then. Um, that gives us a more coarse grained um, type of workload. And um, what we find is that, um, so the speed up that our um, prototype brings is actually significantly affected by the um, serialization overhead. So this is something we observe from the experiments. Um, because um, on one hand, we see that the coarse grained tests, um, they achieve very, um, I would say they achieve very good speed up uh, because it, it's very near the uh, shared memory parallel. But then on the other hand, um, the fine grained tests, um, they are uh, very slow and um, we think it's because of the s large serialization overhead. Um, and here are some of the uh, figures we find. So, um, so on the left, um, again, we have the, like, the execution time on the y-axis and the job size on the x-axis. So um, you can see that um, like, you know, across all job sizes, uh, when you increase the number of workers, um, the execution time just decreases, and then it approaches the um, SMP. Um, and then the one on the right uh, basically shows um, the execution time versus the number of workers. So you can see that um, as the number of workers you know, increases, um, the execution time uh, decreases quite a bit. Um, yeah, so next then so we'll talk about our uh, future, like some future directions. Yeah, so here are some of our ideas for, uh, for where this project, we think this project could go in the future. So uh, as, we, as I just mentioned, uh, one of the main ideas was to add full tolerance. So, um, and and, and, and on, kind of on top of that, we also want to implement some kind of strategy for straggler mitigation. So this is a common technique used in some of the other kind of frameworks that we already mentioned, like uh, MapReduce, where uh, because for some reason, some worker may just be very slow in ex in running its particular task. So, you know, towards the end of the execution stage, we might want to schedule some redundant tasks so that, um, yeah, so that uh, and we can finish execution faster. And they, indeed, they were able to show that this is empirically true. Um, and we also want to kind of uh, maybe uh, implement something parallel for the multi-core system. So for this, uh, we are thinking about uh, doing something where we can kind of somehow analyze the program and then construct a similar uh, tree-like structure uh, that you know, where we can reason about the data dependencies, and then from there we can figure out kind of where to put it the um, like kind of the annot annotations for, for example, using the Parmonad, and then yeah, and then we can generate a program from there that you know can in turn be run on shared memory processors, and uh, and uh, one of the things, one of the main limitations with our current approach is that we have big overhead for serializing and deserializing from whether like it's large matrices and such. So uh, our idea here is to maybe use some kind of uh, binary format, like for example, the dot pickle format for in Python, where yeah, the, the overhead is much, much uh, less. And uh, we also had an idea here to enforce coarser granularity in the sense that if we have a set of independent tasks uh, ready at a stage, we can actually kind of merge them into a single task, send them to be executed on a single worker, and then when the result um, gets them back, we can then kind of destructure the uh, response and then kind of figure out you know, which one is the result corresponding uh, result of execution for each uh, specific task. And uh, lastly, we also want to be able to support uh, side effects, and we'd imagine, you know, for for truly maybe for scalability, you know, this would be have to be if we would have to kind of interface with some kind of external APIs or uh, external infrastructure, like some kind of distributed database, where we can like kind of write the intermediate results, uh, you know, maybe similar to how um, you know how MapReduce did that and how uh, Spark, you know, uh, they, they they did that with the their uh, RDDs. Yeah, and that's uh, that's all we have. So yeah, again, we are uh, we're uh, we're very we're like um, right. We are students, and we are you know we're not uh, any experienced in any sense in Haskell or in distributed systems. So this is just kind of an idea that we had for a course project, and we 
uh, we really want to hear like kind of what you think of this like and uh, yeah just really any feedback is welcome also I guess if this project is useful at all or like where we could kind of take this in the future yeah thank you Uh, Satnam Singh, uh, Grok. It's great to see people working on Haskell and distributed systems. Um, are close to my heart. I've got some suggestions for actually future work and reliability that you mentioned. So really big distributed systems, they achieve all these nice properties we want through things like replication, load balancing, they're orchestrated. So uh, what could be a, a cool direction might be to go in the direction of like Kubernetes and trying to make a connection to an orchestration system like that uh, so that you could get a balance between using an existing framework which explicitly has aspects that are explicit and marry it with the implicit uh, distribution that you're trying to discover. So it's not a question, it's just a, a recommendation of one direction to, to, to look at. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we definitely thought of that and we just didn't really have the time to experiment with Kubernetes, but yeah, we did kind of thought of like kind of, yeah, scheduling it instead of, uh, yeah, kind of putting it in a dockerized environment and kind of schedule, yeah, schedule instead of to be running inside these pods and yeah, different machines because Kubernetes I mean, handles a lot of these kind of uh, low balancing automatically. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a orchestration, container orchestration system. So yeah, I think that'll be very nice to kind of, yeah, for us to use in future, yeah. Armando from Mercury. Uh, so you mentioned uh, like Hadoop and Spark is this as an alternative, uh, but have you considered using parts of what you've built to run on like that sort of infrastructure? Because there's a lot of nice things about it and lots of companies have like these old HTFS clusters and they're just terrible to program on because even Spark's not that great. Right. Um, and the Haskell options are also not good. So um, have you considered like going that route? Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, so I, I guess, so yeah, originally what we thought is to really kind of be able to kind of help run any Haskell program. So in that sense, uh, like, I guess there are some things that we, uh, it's just not inherently possible, but I think uh, we, we, we did think about other ideas of like, I guess, yeah, f writing something that more high level and then kind of, kind of like how, how, you know, how SQL works on top of like, for example, PySpark and, you know, how, how, right, how these execution engines, right, they translate SQL queries into concrete algorithms that can actually get run. So I think, yeah, we did also have some ideas like that, but yeah, I think if we, for, if we were to make this work with Spark, I think we have to be very specific with what kind of user programs, maybe more like heavy on data processing, more explicit about like, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so, right, yeah, I think that's also definitely something that we can look into, yeah. All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. So Simon Jones, Epic. I'm so I'm apologetic that I didn't make the beginning of your talk, um, but so but so maybe we've already answered this question. But how do your distributed the the components of your distributed system? How do they communicate with each other? How much how how involved is the programmer in orchestrating or describing that communication? I mean, one one distinction might be they barely see it. It's just as if there was a big shared memory. Another might be it's like Erlang, you send messages, or it might be somewhere in between. Yeah, so our implementation actually, so with our current prototype, all the user needs to do is pass in the profile, like, uh, so sorry, pass in the program with .hs, some kind of .hs yeah. file. And then, yeah, we okay, handle So it's fully implicit. Yeah, truly implicit. Yeah. We handle everything for it. For so it, the, yeah. the tricky thing about that then is that it's, um, uh, the cost model is a bit unclear, right? So if you need, you know, if, you, if you're going to execute f of x over there, and x turns out to be a terabyte data structure, then there's an awful lot of data to send across your distributed fabric, right? So um, have you thought about whether you might, how, how you might give the programmer some control over what, what gets done where. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, we haven't really thought, to be honest, we haven't really thought a lot about that. We did realize that, yeah, like when, when large amounts of data get sent around, it's, it's quite tricky to still uh, make sure that it's still performant and the overhead is not too large and it doesn't really kind of, uh, yeah, offset with the, you know, the speed up, uh, uh, the parallel speed up. And uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll definitely, Kind of, uh, look okay, so that. kind of experience report then from the past, right, you know, like a, 20 years ago, is this is really <laughs> hard and we yeah, basically right. failed, right? right so, yeah, you sure. know, you may do better for than sure. us, but it's really tough. Um, yeah, for sure, and for so sure. Some, 
uh, either you need to have some extremely high bandwidth mechanism, I don't know, remote DMA mechanisms or something, where you're very close to the network, you, you're very systemsy about it, or else you need, maybe you need to get programmers a bit more involved in a, a bit more like Cloud Haskell, perhaps, right. which was very explicit about, you know, it's really adopting the Erlang model. That's the other end of the spectrum. Or maybe you could do something in between. But just trying to say, uh, we're going to have a big, you know, shared memory across the planet, um, that, and we're going to automatically make sure all of the data appears in the right place at the right time. I don't think it'll ever work. Uh, I, I think it's too hard. Right, uh, that's for sure, yeah. 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 I think, well, yeah, over time, I think we'll probably move to somewhere in between. Like, yeah, uh, yeah right, yeah, I think you just mentioned. But, yeah. uh, over time, I would start soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, very cool, very cool project. Um, I guess a similar question, you know, so with something like, like PAR, you know, like the, you only get the programmer specified parallelism. With a pr an approach like yours, you know, you have this very fine grained parallelism, but you, I think there's a, a risk that, you know, the sort of concurrency overhead overwhelms the, the parallel speed up. So have you thought about how to, you know, whether there's a happy medium where, you know, like you can, you know, the, maybe the, the, the programmer and the system can work together to, to not, you know, parallelize every call to, to plus? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's for sure. I think, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, kind of like what Simon mentioned. I think, yeah, uh, yeah, it would be nice to, you know, let the kind of programmer have some say over what chunks of the program they want to be paralleled, and maybe they know that, you know, for example, they wrote something like some map function and some foldr or foldr, then they, yeah, well, obviously that, a lot of that could be paralyzed. So, yeah, I think, yeah, we will, yeah, well, that's a very good direction that we should definitely look into, and we will, yeah. Cool. Hi, uh, Ben here with uh, Summer of Haskell. Very cool work. I'm wondering if uh, your implementation right now takes into account laziness at all. Like one of the great benefits of Haskell is the ability to commute, com compute things lazily. So as a simple example, a function which takes two parameters, second one is inordinately expensive, first one is really cheap, the function just returns the first argument. In that sort of case, does your mechanism protect and make sure that you don't accidentally send the second argument to its own process that takes a million years only to just return the first argument? Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good question. I think, yeah, we, we, yeah, well, uh, we, we did saw some like previous work that were uh, kind of uh, more focused on trying to figure out like doing some kind of analysis and trying to figure out which functions are actually lazy and yeah, a lot of it was very heavy on yeah, uh, uh, stack analysis and yeah, our current approach, yeah, we, we're strict right now. So yeah, we, we don't really take that into account, but I think we can definitely try to incorporate some of that work to see, you know, uh, if we can kind of, uh, yeah, to try to determine if, uh, but I think that a lot of that work is more low level. So it'd be, I expect it to be quite challenging, but yeah, to integrate yeah, this, I mean, this kind of thing, yeah. At a certain point, you're just like running a synthesized Haskell on right. top of Haskell to figure, like, at the end of the day, you might just have to compute it to actually figure out what needs to get computed, which ruins the problem. Right, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But very cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Then we have other 